As an eight-year-old boy, he built a playhouse out of old mining crates that was larger than his family's home. This creativity spawned a love for writing, which he shared with a childhood friend. And when tragedy struck, he dove even deeper into that passion. In today's episode, he talks about being an author and how hard work and proper education play a critical role in finding success in a very competitive field. Welcome to the Socks and Soul podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Ditto. Thanks for joining us. Let's go. I'd like to welcome into the studio my friend, Saul Hansen. Saul, thanks for coming down. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm excited to have you. So there's a couple of things that you need to know about Saul. Uh, so he lives down the street from me. They bought the uh, they bought one of the most humble looking houses on the street on purpose. They wanted you wanted to fix her upper, but the best part is when you started telling me about what you were going to do to that little house of yours, and uh, and you've done it. And you know, amongst other things, it's a it's a one story uh, home with a full basement. And he's like, what we're going to do is we're going to punch out the basement wall and dig it out and make a terraced, you know, kind of back patio here. And, and I was just like, what are you, t- what are you talking about, man? I could not believe, I could not believe what I was hearing. And that's when I learned something fascinating about you, Saul, is that you are a visionary, you are a dreamer, and you just go do stuff and you don't really care what other people think about it. I, I appreciate you saying that, actually, by the way. I think that's, that's uh, um, really generous for you to say. And I, I love to create. And so I think that one of the things that is really um, fortunate and lucky, I think, is that when, because some people, when you have a creative bug, you have to create, mm-hmm. like you you have to, and if you don't, then you're you're not healthy. And so, luckily for me, I get the same amount of I, I guess like creative release, you know, to where it, you know it kind of feels like breathing, you know, just like whew, oh yeah, you know, oh yeah, and uh, and I get that same release whether I'm pushing a pencil, drawing, or whether I'm writing a book, or whether I'm swinging a hammer. Mm-hmm. And and I'm really glad of that because then it enables me to you know have a lot of outlets you know for that type of and you've, energy and you've I mean this this kind of powerful creativity is something that you discovered a long time ago you know you you once described to me a tree or, or a, a not even a tree house like a fort house mansion that you built you know on your on your back property and it and it sounded like every kid's playhouse fantasy yeah yeah um and you know what i i don't know exactly like where that came from or or why um but uh definitely like the 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 need and the desire to build things because because it, it was it was pretty cool for a 12 year old to yeah, build exactly. and and then the uh and then the fort before that um which was in the desert of nevada and my dad uh, worked at, at a mine down there, and he would just bring home uh, basically the the crates from dynamite and just just different things uh, where it was, you know, crates of lumber and different things. And he would just kind of stockpile it, just like, hey, maybe this will be useful someday. And so he kind of had this yard for those types of things. And you know, is uh, I think I was eight years old, and you know, I was looking at my dad and how busy he was. I'm like, he's never going to use that stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm like, so I'll just use it. So then I started, you know, taking all those materials as he added to it and started building forts. And so the the first fort that I built had, uh, I built a room and they were built out of crates, right? So you just stand up the crates on each side to get the and walls these are, in height. How, how big are these crates? What are we they're talking like about? They're like five, they're, they're like, uh, so s- some of them were different sizes, you mm-hmm. know? So some of them were were pretty big, mm-hmm. you know, like... I, the biggest were probably six feet by eight feet. Oh, these are big. I'm thinking like and, you know milk carton crates. Oh, sure. No, they're sure. they're bigger. Yeah, they're they're bigger wooden crates. Gotcha. For, okay. For uh, whatever supplies mines use. You sure. Know? And then he would just break down the sides. Mm-hmm. And and the, and I remember they were they were really heavy. Um, I'd have to um, 
lean it up a little bit and then prop it up, lean it up a little bit, prop it up, and then be able to stand them up. <laughs> you know, as an eight-year-old, you know, it was, an eight-year-old. It was really hard. Um, and but some of them were just normal crates where they're just four feet by four feet. You know, uh-huh. so between those all, I, I, I would build a room for each of my friends and then each of my brother's friends and each of my sister's friends, and so there were twenty-four rooms total. Your fort that you built as an eight-year-old had twenty-four rooms. Yeah, so we. This li- is what I'm talking about. <laughs> when I when I tell you that Saul Hansen is a guy that just creates stuff and doesn't care what people thinks, you know, none of none of us know eight-year-olds that are building stuff like that. I I was. A really strange kid, I think. <laughs> and so, and because uh, we, we lived in a double wide, you know. In, your fort was probably bigger than your house. It was. It was much <laughs> bigger than our house. Um, so, you you know, when you were driving from the highway, you you know, you just saw the double wides and you saw this just monstrosity, you know. Um, what did your parents think about that on their property? What's that? You know what? Uh, my parents were so supportive. That's they, cool. They, they were just great. And, uh, they must have been because you, you just continued to foster that creativity as, as life went on, like your projects got bigger and more ambitious. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that that's, I think that's how everything works. You know, I got a little bit older building those forts and then you want to challenge yourself more. And then, so then, you know, I started helping people frame houses and things like that. And then eventually you get to the point where you're like, I want to do cabinetry, you know, like I, I want to do like complex joinery just to see if I can do it. For sure. You know? And, and so you're looking at chairs and you're looking at the way cabinet doors open and close and you're thinking about the tools you'd need to make that work and maybe a better way to do it. Yeah. That's the way your mind was working, I imagine. Yeah. And and I and I think that it just takes a while to get familiar with something before you're ready to go to the next step. Yeah. I just think that's just the way that things work, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, then, uh, and then, you know, you're like, hey, I'm ready, you know, for more and then you just take it on. So, so so this kind of, this kind of discovery and love of building led you to follow uh, architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I felt that, uh, if I pursued a career in architecture that I could learn the ins and outs of the residential housing market and eventually might be able to be positioned to, uh, because of the way that technology was emerging with, uh, especially with manufactured homes and it's exactly what Katera is doing out in Spokane Valley. If you know, what are they doing? Tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, there's, uh, Katera and then they've partnered with McKinstry to where basically, and so right now they're working more with like, um, 24 unit apartment buildings, right. Where they're kind of like, specializing in that size but then as soon as they get that it's kind of like the tesla thing right Mm -hmm. it's like we're gonna do you know this level of car get really good at it we're gonna do one thing really well dial it in perfectly make a ton of money yeah and then be able to expand to other other markets so they're taking the exact same approach and so they're going to the 24 unit apartment that's like three stories tall is probably the most built apartment in the United States. Okay. And as far as size goes. Yeah, sure. So that's what they're choosing to do. And so normally, you know, there's all this different stuff where it takes all this time traditionally stick, stick framing it right to where now they're basically like building Ikea kits of entire units to where everything is built in a factory first. And then it's just given a number an assembly number and then it's shipped on site and then they, you know, they just assemble it. They don't build it, right? Because it's already built, right? So all the plumbing's already in the walls. All the electric, all the electrical's already in the walls. And we're, I mean, this is something that we're seeing more and more, even with homes. Like the 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 home kit is becoming a more popular, you know, thing that people are choosing to do. I've I've noticed. Yes, yes, and so that t- that technology is becoming more readily available, and and it will just continue to to be that way. To it, I think it'll become more the technology will become more available for different people to where smaller shops will eventually be able to open. And then, you know, cause, uh, you know, companies don't determine their prices. It's the competitors that determine. Of course. Prices, right? right. And so as soon as, you know, that, uh, industry opens up to smaller guys and it's going to become a lot tighter and then housing prices are going to come down because mm-hmm. the labor prices go down. Right. And so, because the majority of everything is, is the labor mm-hmm. and the advantage too in a, in a manufactured facility is you don't have rain, 
you know, raining on, you know, possibly causing mold or whatever in, in, in the structure. So everything is far more precise because it's in a controlled environment. Right. And so there's just a lot of different benefits. And so, um, I, I could see that coming, um, when I started college, when I was in, uh, I think it was around 2009. And I was like, you know, that's, that's coming. That's the future yeah. of architecture. Where, where um, automation, like the industrial uh, revolution, the, the industrial like assembly line process is going to clash mm -hmm. and, you know, like meet with the construction industry. Sure. And there's going to be a marriage there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it, it has happened and it's uh, happening faster and faster and faster. Mm. And so, um, so I, I thought if I can be positioned and know a lot about the industry, then about spe specifically residential housing, then, then I thought that a lot of people could be helped because if, if a lot of people can be, um, uh, granted access to more accessible housing, then, you know, it's going to free up a ton of their income. Cause I think that say in, in, in most areas of the country, I think that like 30% of your income is expected to go towards your housing. Mm -hmm. And if you can get less than that, then that much more of your income can go towards your lifestyle sure. or towards, you know, um, lessons for your kids, you know, right. just, just boosting all types of, um, uh, quality of life. And so, so that was like really exciting to me. And so, um, and now I'm at a company that, uh, is really great at allowing me to learn those things to, to be better positioned to, you know, I guess become an expert in those things, which is really great. Um, so I'm, I feel so that's kind of, that's kind of your, your career path is, is this kind of fabricated concept of architecture and how that can be a, a way to help humanity. Yeah. You know, I, that's, that's definitely where I, that's why <laughs> I started. That's like why I got into it. And, uh, and in, and it's why I stay excited about it. But that is very cool. I mean, right now I'm way down the ladder. <laughs> the reality is, you're the one who kind of pioneered prefabricated structures, right? <laughs> I mean, you took the crates; they were prefabricated, and uh, you turned them into a house, uh, a 24 bedroom. Maybe you that's know? why it made so much sense. <laughs> you're I like, uh, yeah, I've been doing this since I was eight, doy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, but had had a tremendous amount of fun, and uh, doing those things, I think, was just extremely healthy. And, uh, and, and I hope that in some way that I can, you know, help, help pass that on in some way to other people. Cause, cause I think that, um, like, I'm not sure why I, I happened upon it, but I definitely happened upon the truth that there is tremendous fulfillment in hard work. And I love that. And that there's like, um, the suffering side of it doesn't bother me because I know of how I know how great the feeling is the satisfaction at the end and so so i don't really understand people who like of are are, are um suffering averse <laughs> who, who are who are afraid you know to put in the hard work to reap the benefit of that hard work yeah absolutely and that's a that's a great lesson Saul. And, and so um i would much rather suffer now yeah. um than than later yeah. And, and so pretty much in, in everything that I do, I just be like, man, like this is gonna, this is gonna suck <laughs> to get this done. And I would, I would rather suffer now than later. So let's just, let's just do it. Well, there's the old, I don't know where it came from that, which you receive too easily, you esteem too lightly. Mm. And there is something truly wise about the concept of earning the things that you have and appreciating them, you know, whatever the struggle was that took you to earn it. Absolutely. You know, I mean, e even the as simple lesson as, you know, Marin, you know, my nine year old really wanted a ukulele and I was like, great, go make some money and buy a ukulele. And, uh, and after, you know, after she stopped rejecting the notion, she and her friend put together a lemonade stand. Not enough cars were stopping at the lemonade stand. So they took their lemonade on the road and started selling it door to door. Nine-year-olds. They made $50 in one day. That's awesome. And, uh, and they paid a little for the supplies. They split the profit. And uh, she, brought, she brought $18 to me and 
you know, showed me which ukulele she wanted. And, and it's like her prized possession now. That's amazing. And, and it's, you know, it's as simple as what you're talking about. Mm. Don't be afraid of the hard work. Don't be afraid of the journey. Mm. You know, I love that. I love that. You know what though is like something that I've thought about, you know, since, since I've got kids that, uh, uh, I hope are that gutsy. And I think that parents have the responsibility to actually vet things like different business ideas of their children <laughs> to, to be like, yeah. there's, there's actually demand for this mm-hmm. so that they can be successful. Yeah. Because I think that if you don't, and then they, they try and sell something that there's no demand for, yeah. um, that they're going to experience defeat too yeah. early yeah, absolutely, and then be afraid. Yeah. And, and so. you know, the other thing I was talking to a friend of mine a couple of years ago and, and he and I both grew up in homes where our fathers were good at their jobs, really good at their jobs, but they were not entrepreneurs. And, and, and I wasn't exposed to entrepreneurism, yeah, at least it, from my home life. I had great parents who taught me the value of hard work, the value of education, the value of following through on your word, all really important principles that have made me and my siblings, you know, fairly successful people um, by, by lots of measures. But we weren't exposed to entrepreneurism. Mm-hmm. Like my dad never said to me, you know what you ought to do, Kelly? You know, you ought to start a business doing this thing that you're really good at and that you like. And it, it was never part of our family culture. And I would love and I've tried with my kids to change that, mm-hmm. you know, to show them that, you know, my oldest Addison, he's 17. You know, I started when he was very young. I'm like, listen, mowing lawns as a teenager is a gold mine. It's so easy for you to do. And, uh, and you know, and he, he sort of embraced it, mm-hmm. not as much as I would have hoped. But now he's working at IHOP. And I, you know, and I, you know, I had the discussion. I was like, now you get to go earn money, what I call the hard way. And the hard way is they tell you when to come in. They tell you how much you're paid. They tell you what to wear and they tell you when your breaks are versus you make your own schedule. You get your clients, you set the price. And if you're really good at it, you get other people to do the work right? right. and you just manage the cruise. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, and, and that's, you know, that's what I referred to, you know, to him as the easy way. Hmm. But this idea of teaching our kids you know, helping them identify successful endeavors. I think it's, I think it's really critical mm-hmm. as, as parents. So your, your nine to five, if you will, mm-hmm. is this architectural career, um, which is super interesting to me, especially, like I said, because of, you know, these forts that you, that you told me about. That is one of many things that you do. We've talked about a little bit about your massive home remodel that you're doing on that little place, which is unbelievable. But, but I found out recently that, that you also are an author. <laughs> so, so tell me, tell me what has been going on there and when this started and, uh, you know, bring it, bring me kind of give us the history of how, how this happened. When I was six years old, I went to go and live with my grandparents in Texas and they actually, um, like was it like a summer thing or um, I went to go stay there for, I, I think that I was there for probably about six months. Okay. And so and something going on at home or yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, to where, uh, my mom, I mean, there were seven of us. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so between handling everything, you know, at home, she's like, Hey, I'd, I'd love some help. So I went and stayed with my, with her mom. Uh-huh. And, uh, and honestly, um, I think that that was the best thing that has ever happened in my life. Um, was me being sent to live with my grandmother. And was this a traumatic thing at the time? It wasn't. Okay. Um, how how it, old were it, you? Do you remember? I was six. Oh, you were very young. Okay. And so, and it, and it wasn't for me. Um, so like, I remember, you know, a very, very long car ride, you know, that <laughs> <laughs> there was just beyond long because we drove the whole thing. And, uh, and one of my older sisters went, went with me and, uh, but, you know, she was in school. And so because she was in school, you know, I didn't get to interact with her a bunch because she was, you know, right. always, always at school. And so I had a lot of time to my, myself. And, and I remember that time really, really well. And so... Um, that house was probably a lot quieter <laughs> than when you <laughs> left, huh? Oh, man. <laughs> and uh, so my grandmother, who came from a family of performers and family of performing artists... Mm. 
I, I think very early identified to like, hey, this kid has an affinity for drawing, an affinity for art. Mm. And so she uh, had an, at that time, you know, had embraced computers and she was like a Mac computer whiz. So she knew tons about, you know, uh, or everything you can know about a Mac computer. She did. Your grandma. So my grandma. Wow. Yeah. Ahead of her time. Oh, totally. Yeah. So she, you know, back in the day, um, you know, like uh, Tetris, you know, the game Tetris on the original oh, yeah. Mac and everything like that. She would compete with uh, all of her grandkids for like the hi- highest score, <laughs> you know, and keep track on things like that. So she was, she was very, very intelligent, very, very smart. And so she kept up on technology really, really well. And, uh, and so she had a, a really, I think, uh, unusual setup as far as like printers were concerned. And, um, and so we had our own printer in the house. And so, um, and with that, it was a, it was a type of paper that was perforated on the sides and had the little holes oh, yeah. so that it could be fed, yeah. you know, through. The old dot matrix printers. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. yeah, we had one of those. And so we, uh, so we had that. And so, uh, you know, between all the different movies that we'd watch, I would make it panoramas of war scenes cool or you know because i could just keep going right you know? <laughs> you're like this paper's connected <laughs> yeah. this is awesome yeah it was great <laughs> it never ends man and and she and she would just let me you know and and she you know was like oh i love it like, keep going and so she's like see how long you can make it you know <laughs> so awesome and uh and so it, it was a lot of fun and and um and so she was very very uh encouraging and um so one of the things i think that she she identified that I was pretty timid at the time um, when I got there, you know, um, probably from having a lot of older kids beating up on me, you know, right? and, uh, you know, older siblings. Mm-hmm. And so, so she got there and she's just like, every single day, we're going to sing this song in front of the mirror. And uh, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the, uh, the singer. He was like a country singer uh, who sang it, but it, it was, uh, uh, oh, gee, it's hard to be humble. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll have to like, perhaps I'll remember his name in a bit, but, um, we would have to sing that song in front of the mirror every single morning. So she, she would wake me up at like Uh 6am, um, like wake up, I'd be like rubbing my eyes and she had a a full size mirror, you know, like, you know, the whole wall and we'd have to get up and we'd sing that song in front of the mirror every single day. That's yep. the first thing she would have you do? That was the very first thing that we'd have, that we'd do in the morning. We had to sing that song in front of the mirror. And then, um, uh, and, and what it did is I think incrementally is it built my confidence <laughs> and made me extremely cocky, <laughs> <laughs> probably for the rest of my life. You went from the timid six year old <laughs> to like being I can like, conquer the world. I can do anything, <laughs> you know? And, and I, I really attribute that attitude to, to my grandmother. Like, sure. like she was absolutely amazing. She instilled a higher level of confidence in you. Oh yeah. So awesome. Yeah. It was, it was incredible. And so that, that like incubatory, uh, period with my grandmother was probably the most critical time period of my whole life. So when I was eight years old, I was, uh, bragging to my best friend at the time. I was like, Oh, I wrote a book when I was six, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, he's like, Oh, well we should write a book together. And I was like, okay. Um, I'm like, let's do it. And so, uh, we were sitting on, you know, my parents have this awesome, super stout table. And so we were, uh, they still have this kitchen table. So we, we were small enough that we were up on this table and we were taking notes. We're like, okay, this is what it's going to be about. And so, um, and he was brilliant. And so he was seven when I was eight and, and he came up with pretty much the entire premise. You know, he's, he's just like, he's like, Hey, he's like, Werewolves have been done. Vampires have been done. You know, because I think like Buffy the Vampire Slayer was like just coming out. You know, right. the first episodes, and he's like, no, it's like all oh, that's been done. He's like, he's like, we got to do something that like nobody, nobody's done before. And so he's like, let's let's do a spin on Greek mythology with gargoyles. <laughs> and I was like, okay. He's a seven year old who said that. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. And so and 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 then he knew Greek mythology really really well. Wow. And so he, then he like was telling me all these different stories and then how we could tweak them. And so, so that's how it started. And he, so he was, I think he was a creative genius. And so, um, uh, but he was not 
a worker. <laughs> ah. And so this is the way he put it, you know, when you talk about like an entrepreneur who, be, you know, manages and then like gets other people to do it. And she's just like, I'll come up with the storyline and you can be my scribe. <laughs> you know, that was like his exact words <laughs> as a seven-year-old. And, uh, and That's so, hilarious. yeah. And I was like, done. And, uh, so we worked on this for years. So we worked on this all the way through high school. What? From that time. I just continued building the story and working on it. And so after that, or between that time period, we moved. That's back. like 10 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. So we just kept working on it. Wow. And, okay. and so eventually we moved here and where he lived, um, in, uh, or where, where we had grown up, there wasn't a lot to do there and it was easy, easy to get into trouble. And so just, just the, the lifestyle there, it was, um, I think that it was, there was a level of excitement. It was very much kind of like the, uh, the type of, uh, environment is like West Side Story, mm -hmm. you know, where there's a lot of different gangs sure. and such. And so there were so many, you know, different gangs and it was so common that it was just like a matter of course to join one of them. It was know? just like, at some point, this is, we're going to like Harry Potter, this thing. And you like pick a tribe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, like one of, you know, eventually, you know, right. you're, you're th there are lines drawn in the sand and you got to pick which side you're on. Right. You know? And so, so that was just kind of even growing up, you know, in like, you know, when we were like 12 and, or I'd say even probably younger than probably 10 and 11. Like we just like knew that like we, we'd eventually be in a gang, you know? <laughs> and, and so, and I remember thinking to myself when I was that age being like, I could never be, um, a, uh, I could never be like the ringleader, but I would be an excellent right hand man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the idea man, but I'll be the scribe. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. And so, so, uh, in anyway, and I, I, I think that that was kind of in, an interesting insight to have that, that young. Yeah. And, uh, and so we moved here, um, back to the family ranch, North of Spokane, Washington. Mm -hmm. Um, I think my parents were concerned with that environment. With and the gang thing. And they were, so was this down in Nevada? It was, yeah. So yeah. it was it was in Winnemucca, Nevada. Okay, yeah. And so most people they either only fill up gas there or they break down there. Right. It's usually the only reason they stop there. And so um yeah, so there's not a whole lot to do, so you get in tr a lot of trouble there. Yeah. And so and I think that there are a lot of different cities like that, you know, sprinkled sure. all throughout the country, you know. And so so we we got out, but he he kinda um you know, just kind of following that course fell into with just a lot of bad things. And so, um, I was extremely concerned uh, for him. And so almost, almost every summer I would ask my parents like, Hey, like, can Lewis come and live with us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, cause I was just so, so concerned for him. Sure. And, uh, and then, and, and it's one of those unique relationships, right? Cause usually when you move, you like keep in contact for a while. Right. And back then, you know, uh, you know, way before cell phones. Yeah. And so, and back then it was like long distance calls, right? Where they just charged you. Oh, through the nose. Through yeah. the nose, right? For long distance calls. It was like letter writing, oh, you know, and yeah. like brief calls. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, he was not a good writer. He was not a good pen pal. He was not a good, he was a horrible. <laughs> You're his scribe. He was, so. uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so I, you know, I'd write like maybe 10 letters for every one I got back, oh, you cool. know. And you so, were dedicated friends. And, so, <laughs> and so, and it was funny because every single letter I did get back was a different girl, you know, <laughs> that you talked about. And so he, and so you could see where his priorities were. Uh -huh. And so, uh, um, but it was, it was really fascinating because we, we did have a really special friendship, a really special bond. And it was interesting because it, he was a type of person who had that with many people. It, like it wasn't just with me. It came pretty naturally for him yes. to connect with people that way. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, it, it, was, it was amazing. So I think that he had many best friends. Like many people considered him their best friend. Yeah. And, and I certainly did. And, but I think that I, I really was one of his best friends. Sure. Like, you know, there was probably a handful of us. And, uh, and so... And uh, so every year, or about every year, I would go and travel all the way back down to Nevada to visit him. To visit him, 
mm-hmm. and hang out with him for a week or so. Yeah. So how old were you when you moved up to, to Elk? So we we turned 12 just a, like a week after uh-huh. um, we came up here. Okay. And then continued to go down there every year. And keep so when would you guys work on the book together then? When you were together or? Um, every time I'd visit him yeah. or, um, you know, I'd keep him informed on things. You know, our parents kept the calls uh, strictly regulated because right. if, if left to our own means, you know, three hours later, you know, we could, we're still going strong, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so they'd have to cut it short, you know, cause we were expensive. And so, uh, our conversations were expensive. Yeah. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we kept in good contact. And then, um, you know, in the, the latter years, you know, whenever I'd go to see him, um, you know, and I'd be there for two or three days, um, it was very, you know, I guess serendipitous with the timing because he was always expelled, you know, <laughs> or, wow. or, you know, uh, you know, you know, suspended um, for different things. He always had lots of free time when you came down That's to right. visit. That's right. That's right. So then we could hang out. <laughs> He's like, hey, Saul, I got expelled. So we're good, man. You yeah. Just it's hang like, out hey, all week. come on down. <laughs> They're like, I don't know if I should be happy about that or <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so I, yeah, so I was, I was especially concerned about him, um, you know, just kind of, you know, seeing, seeing how things were going. So you know, uh, fast forward. So th- when I was 17 and he was 16, he gave me a call, um, where he was, he was in uh, serious trouble. Mm. And, uh, and, and that was a, a really traumatic call for me. And it was, it was a three hour call, Wow! but this time it was, I didn't say anything. He talked the whole he time. He talked the whole time. He told you the whole story. Yeah. He told me everything that was going on. Mm. And and uh, as soon as I got off the phone, because um, my parents were gone, I was home alone, you know, during the day. My parents got back and I was like, we need to buy a plane ticket for Lewis tonight. Like, we got to we gotta get him here now. And they're like, hey, he's, he, and he, he came from an amazing family, incredible parents, like really great parents, like exemplary father. Yeah. You know, just amazing. You know, but, you know, still, you know, happened upon these, these bad habits. And so um, they're like, oh, you know, he's got good parents. Like, he'll be okay. I'm like, I'm like, no, you guys don't understand. Like he's in, he's in trouble. But then they're like, no, like, you know, like his, his parents will, will be all right. They, they got this, you know, I was like, okay. I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll trust you guys. And then, and that was a Saturday. And then I got home from practice, um, you know, from, from school and took a nap after school. And, And my mom and then my brother and my sister, and there's just a line of them came in. And I knew Lewis was dead without them having to say anything. And so as soon as they came around the corner, and, and I just already knew. And, and she said, um, Lewis committed suicide on Sunday night. And so, um, that, that hit real, real hard. And so this story that we had built since we were tiny suddenly took on a whole different level of meaning for me. And so I approached my art teacher and I said, I've never told you this. Uh, cause, cause I actually, I actually never told anyone in my school that I didn't take a foreign language class. I didn't, I didn't tell my freshman and sophomore so I could take more art classes. Uh-huh. And then when I got, you know, to my junior and senior year, they just assumed that I'd taken foreign language classes and, and I just let them believe that. Right. And so I could take more art classes, uh-huh. you know, my, so I never, so I was able to take 13 semesters of art <laughs> while I was in high school. <laughs> so I went to my teacher and I said, I never told you this, but I've been working on a book. And I was always so t- so afraid to tell people. Because when I was little, and I told people that, like, proud of like, hey, I'm, I'm going to write a book. And I'm going to publish a book someday, and I'm going to be an author. And they'd say, oh, that's so cute. Right. And when I was, like, 10, I was like, no, you don't 
understand. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Yeah. And I hated that reaction. Yeah. And so I just stopped telling people, I'm like, well, I'm just going to do well, it. I'll just do it. And then I'll tell you, I'll just bring you a copy of my book. That's right. You know, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's like that way I don't have to deal with those, you know, silly reactions. Right. And so, so I became very, I, it's something that I kept really close to my chest. Sure. So I, I took to my, my, uh, art teacher and was like, Hey, um, I've been writing a book. And I was kind of expecting to hear, um, oh, that's cute, you know, because that's what I'd always heard. And, and it was the first time that I heard a different response. And he said, that doesn't surprise me. Oh, man. How validating was that? And, and I said, I was wondering if you would allow me to use one of my three art periods that I have with you this year. <laughs> three art periods with the same teacher. <laughs> to, uh, to, to write my book. And he's like, done. And he's like, whatever papers I need to, to sign so that, you know, they think you're taking an art class. It's like, done. And so, uh, so, that's, so that's what I did. So I would write, r- write that book, um, and then when I got home, I transcribed what I wrote in class that day. And so um, my, my senior year of high school is when I wrote the manuscript for the first book in that series. And so it was supposed to be one book. But then upon connecting with people in the industry, they're like, it's too long. And so you need to break it into pieces. They're like, look, man, Roots is too long. You got to break that thing down. Yeah. And so <laughs> nobody's reading 800 page books, Saul. That's right. That's right. Cause it, it was about that long, you know, it was, was it, really? it was long. It was, wow. uh, it was, oh man. So if I can add up, um, so there are, we broke it into seven books Wow. and each book was at least a hundred thousand words. And so, um, to put in perspective, you know, like the last Harry Potter books, which are, you know, yeah. like two or three inches thick, yeah. um, were 250,000 words each. Wow. You know, yeah. and so is it, it, it was, a, it was, a yeah, lot. they were substantial. So it was far too much to be in one book. For sure. Know, for sure. So it did need to be broken up. And so, but the first one I wrote my, that senior year in high school. And then, um, you know, I also served a mission for my church and which, uh, you know, which, which was uh, good and bad for that, um, for the space I was in. Yeah. If that makes sense. Because I was, I yeah. think, more fragile than most who, sure. who go out. But um, before I went on my mission, I told my parents, I was like, hey, I want to finish writing this book before I go, the mm-hmm. whole thing. Mm-hmm. And so I sat down and, you know, we had 10 years of notes. Um, so I had just graduated high school. And I had, you know, the first, you know, start, which what became the first book um, in in my Underworld series with the Gargoyles. Yeah, right. And uh, with the twist on Greek mythology. With the, tw- with the twist on Greek mythology. Yeah. And so what we did, um, or what I did is I basically just scheduled it out. And I was like, okay, um, in order to have it done by the end of summer, I need to write eight pages a day. And so I was like, okay, I don't even know how long, how many pages or how long it will take to write eight pages a day. But so looking at my notes, I would just cram. And by then I, I could type about 90 words a minute. Wow. I was, I was pretty quick. Yeah. And so it would take me about an hour a page, you know? And uh, so it'd take about eight hours to write eight pages, you know, on average. So I would wake up, at like seven in the morning and start typing just and go for eight hours. And then after that, um, you know, just help with things around the house. And then, um, I did that for, I think three months. And then I, you know, looked at all my outlines that I had broken down and I was like, eight pages isn't enough. Like it's not, I'm like, this is taking too long. So I'm like, so let's double it. So let's do 16 pages a day, which is 16 hours a day, you know, at least. And so I was like, okay. And so I, again, I just start at seven and just, 
And so it went for another four months at 16 pages a day. Wow. You know, where each page is, you know, 500 words, you know, per page. And so, wow. um, and so, so in seven months was able to write all, all of those books. It became seven books. And, uh, and so, and then as soon as it was done, I was like, okay, like now my mind can rest. Um, and it, it really became like a healing process for all the different things I was kind of internalizing and dealing with through, through Lewis's suicide. Right. And was able to put a lot of those, uh, internal turmoil questions and internal turmoil and real drama, like real, uh, darkness yeah. into the characters in the story. So that, you know, I'd always wanted to be a writer, um, you know, since I was six, I, I did not realize how difficult it is to learn the craft of writing. Yeah. And so that first series that I did was very much off of reflex and very much off of, uh, uh, being tapped into a prolonged state of flow. Sure. Where it just came. Yeah. I, and it just flowed through me. Yeah. Onto the page. Yeah. It's like, I feel like I hardly even wrote it. Yeah. And that's how the entire thing was. Yeah. It, it was remarkable. Yeah. It was a remarkable experience. And, um, and so I still look back on, on those books and just like, wow, like that, that was a really special time. Yeah. And it's a special story. Yeah. But, um, so, um, what happened then is right before I left on my mission, my dad ran into Sean Astin, um, um, in the Seattle airport and, uh, and my dad saw him coming onto the, coming onto the plane, um, with, uh, two little girls and, and his, and his wife and he saw the little girls and he's just like, those are the little, he's a, at least one of those little girls is the same girl on the end of the Lord of the Rings, um, the little hobbits. And he looked up and he saw Sean Astin <laughs> and he said, Sam. Because <laughs> Sean Astin plays Sam in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, he plays he's Sam also, yeah. I mean, he's a pretty famous actor. Yeah, Rudy. And, Rudy is his, one of his big yeah, roles, and, breakout roles. And, and yeah. Goonies. You yeah, know, right, and, Goonies, of course. Oh, man, yeah. so, I mean, I mean, so many great roles yeah, that yeah. He's, he's played in. And uh, so, and without skipping a beat, he uh, he walked right up to my dad, and he has, like, holes in his jeans, my dad said. You know, he just, like, you know, had a baseball cap, holes in his jeans, yeah. and... and uh, and he, he just smiled, you know, grinned and walked up to my dad. And he's like, he's like, he's like, that's right. He's like, he's like, uh, yes, I am. And what's your name? <laughs> and then my dad introduced himself and it's like, hey, my, my son is writing a, a series. He's been writing a series. This was in December. And, uh, and so he's like, you know what? It would mean the world to him if you would call him. Um, would you mind doing that? And I can't believe that my dad had the guts to ask that. That's very gutsy. That's pretty dang gutsy. And like, say if I ran into Sean Aston now, first of all, I think I would ask if I could give him a hug. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I would not ask him to do that. <laughs> yeah. Like, can I take a selfie with you? And can I take, you know, right. Okay. Like I, I'm not even bold enough to ask for a selfie, <laughs> you know, like, you know, I, I'd like look at him and be like, man, I, I bet you get that enough. I'm just going to let I'm just you gonna let you go on yeah. your way in peace, man. Be like, I respect you so much. But right. I'm, I'm going to let you have your space. Yeah. And so I can't believe my dad did that, you know? And so, so cool. Yeah. Super cool. And so when he called me, I was listening to like the last track of the Lord of the Rings writing the last scene in the whole manuscript Wow! when he called. And, uh, he actually called you. Yeah. And he called me and, Man. and he said, Hey, um, I'd love to take a look at your story. He's like, let me give you my email address. Oh and, my gosh. And like, that is so cool. Shoot it, you know, shoot over to me and, and, uh, you know, shoot, over, shoot me over a synopsis. And I was like, well, I don't even know how to write a synopsis. So then he's like, so anyway, he gave me his email address and, uh, which I still remember. Um, and, uh, even though it isn't active anymore, um, but I, I still remember it. And so he, uh, we corresponded, uh, f for about, uh, I think for over three months until I left on my mission. Wow. And so he had just published, uh, there and back again, an actor's tale. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so he had just gone through the entire process of publication. And so pretty much everything that he shared was basically navigating 
that the publication process and which was so generous of him to take the time oh my to do gosh it. some random stranger in the airport yeah i mean I, how cool is that I, guy i still cannot even believe it man that, and that he continued to you know over months yeah just absolutely amazing and he was just um just absolutely wonderful and i hope that i can meet him in person someday so then you know, uh, over a long process, was able to uh, get the book published through Sourced Media Books, which I think was a miracle in, in just how that entire thing panned out. So that got published. The first one got published in 2013. And then um, by, I think, a year or maybe a year and a half later, we were able to have all seven out. And, and you know, because it just, you know, it was kind of like boom, 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 got them all out. And, uh, so that was very exciting. It was a very exciting process where I learned a ton. I'm sure about the yeah. the whole, you know, everything that Sean had tried to, to teach me when I was 18. Yeah, um, I was able to to use, it, you know, at that at that time in in 2013 through 2014, and so, and then around uh, 2015, um, you know, there had been a year gap since I'd written anything, and I was like. I, uh, and, and the books, you know, the, the whole, that whole series hadn't taken off like crazy. I sure. think that between all of them, it sold like maybe like 550 copies. That's you know? awesome. You know, which isn't bad. No, you know? that's awesome. But like, I think they, you know, there's a statistic that says that, um, only 1% of authors will sell more than 5,000 copies. Wow. And so my first goal is to sell more than 5,000 copies. Right, to be in the... Of, yeah. of a book sure right like not of an entire series you yeah. know because split up i'm like oh that doesn't count you know right because it like five five hundred and fifty divided by seven you know like you know like that's even worse <laughs> right and so i was like okay like i like my goal my first goal is to get to five thousand because then i'm better than 99 percent of writers absolutely in the whole world that's right and as a competitive side of me i was just like That'd be sweet, right? To be able to know that I'm in the one percent. It's pretty elite company. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. like you'd have to be, you have to be pretty good, yeah, to do that. And it, and at that point, it's not an accident. Yeah. And so, so when I was, um, it, you know, in that stage, and I was like, I need to know if I'm cut out for this, and I need people in the industry who know, right, to be able to tell me, to give it to me straight, to man. give it to me straight, right? Like otherwise, I'm going to waste a ton of time right. that I could spend investing in other things would be, you know, time better well spent. Like sure. perhaps I'm not cut out for this. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, even though, you know, I was super invested in being a writer and all this thing, I'm like, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm I can't make the cut. Yeah. I'm like, and I need to know, I want to achieve a level of mastery of writing. And the only way to do that is just like a martial art is you have to become a student of the craft. Absolutely. So uh, I found a writer's conference in New York. So I found this one, and it only accepted like a certain number of people. And it and it did have really good reviews. And so I think it only, it only, they only take like, I think up to like 50 or 60 people a year. And because they, they have, they break it up by genre, right? Sure. And then they have like groups of like 10 to 15 per genre, mm-hmm. right? And so, and then they have uh, different like uh, leaders who are uh, industry, they're, they're in the industry, so they're in the know, they're completely educated in that genre, and then they become kind of the facil- facilitators for that genre. Sure. And so you can't even go to that uh conference without a finished manuscript sure so you have to have a finished manuscript to pitch right and they have all this homework that you have to do before you even go to prep for right it so that you can actually be prepared to give a pitch and where it's like an elevator pitch and so you go and the first thing that you do after all this work that you've done which took weeks of work to do all the homework to 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 go so went to new york went to this conference and in the first hour um, learned that the story that I took, um, that there was no market for it. Oh no. And, uh, <laughs> and in, well, and it was in the first few seconds, but it was in the first hour of the conference. You're like, what did I just do? <laughs> and cause I think what happened is they're like, 
He's like, who wants to go first? And I was like, let's get this done, you know? Because <laughs> um, one of the things that they asked, they're, you know, in a survey, they're like, why are you coming to this? And one of the things on it was, um, I'm here for a wake up call. Um, and it's like, do you want it? Do you want us to tell it to you straight? It's like, yes. Yes, that's why I'm here. Check. Am I cut out for this thing? Yep. Yeah. So, so went and, uh, and it, and it was, it was pretty interesting. So, um, of the 12 of us that were in our group. So the gentleman who runs that, um, writer's conference, he is, happened to be the facilitator for science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. So he was the one who was over our group. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the guy is just a kick. He's just so much fun. And really was born to do that like so it's just a blast and so uh six of the 12 of us our manuscripts were burned to ashes right out of the gate right out of the gate they're just like just, nope <sighs> nope nope yep just because <sighs> we did our we did our pitches and then he uh tore down probably for 10 10 to 15 minutes per person on all the reasons why it was not good wow and uh, and why and why it wouldn't work? Yeah. But then he's like, "But if you tweak this, this, and this, then it might have hope." And so, um, so then he he basically said to all of you, "He's like, okay, you <laughs> to all of us." He said, "Okay, to six of you specifically, <laughs> it's like you paid to pitch a story to four editors of the top editors, you know that I can get that I can attract." Yes. Yeah. It's like so. Um, He's like, uh, you paid for it, so you might as well uh, pitch something, right? <laughs> totally. It's like so from the you ashes. You came and paid for it. So, <laughs> it's like so from the ashes that is your manuscript. You need to come up with something else. Yeah. By tomorrow, <laughs> to pitch to to the first, you know, eight um, editors. Um, basically, he's like, okay, we have the rest of today to basically build a premise, and so uh, the way that that conference works is you know we'd have like a session where you know they teach something and then we go and do like a pub crawl so then we'd go to like one pub yeah and then uh and and then while everybody's getting drinks or appetizers or whatever everybody is just sharing ideas cool you know all 12 people oh, so wow. so even the the 12 the other six who whose uh, manuscripts were good could still needed improvement so everyone it was just like the most creative atmosphere um, by the end of the day in the evening, you know, like all of us are pretty exhausted, but we're still like pumped. Like oh, we're just yeah. like on, Oh, you're so excited. On creative energy. Right? right. Like we're just like, so like, usually I think my mind would have been mush, but I was still like, I think I was like running on adrenaline. Yeah. And I think everybody was. Yeah. And so, and everybody was just so helpful to each other. When I finally, uh, read him the last pitch. It was, oh, I think it was probably 6 p.m., something like that, you know, and it was wrapping up for the night. And he said, that's it. He's like, that's your pitch. He's like, but you are missing the most important element of that, which is the antagonist. Mm -hmm. He's like, if you don't have a good antagonist, you don't have a story. Right. He's like, so, he's like, you, he's like, so tonight you have to pin down the antagonist and put it into, and, and, and fit and, it. And put in, it into the pitch into somewhere. The pitch. He's like, and then you're set. Yeah. And so based off of like all the different things that, you know, I had gone through, I wrote, um, rewrote the pitch by about two or two thirty in the morning. Um, and so the way that it worked, right. Is that I had sat in this chair, right. It's like a, a huge circle, right. It's like a semicircle. And I had sat in, in the closest chair to, the facilitator sure the first time i was like oh that guy goes first so i like <laughs> i'm gonna start on the other side Shoo! so i went all the way to the other side and sat in the second to last chair and uh next to a gentleman named jeremy and uh and so i sat there and uh and i was like okay like i still need to finish writing the pitch i need to polish it real quick and so people thought i was taking notes so the editor um, there were, there were four editors that we pitched to and that editor that day, he said he, he, all the other editors were one-on-one -on -one. and Brendan Deneen came in and he said, I want everyone to give their pitches to me at the same time, because I might say something that benefits other, it benefits yeah, everybody. Right. Sure. 
and uh and and so and man that guy that guy's pretty legit he's, he's awesome sure and uh very very impressed with him and so i was half listening you know half writing down so people think i'm taking notes and i finished writing my pitch maybe 10 seconds <laughs> before it was my turn <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> and uh <laughs> that's funny and so because i you know i thought that i was going to have at least a half an hour oh, you know sure. to to finish you know writing it before you know anything started so then uh i you know looked at him i was like do you mind if i read it and he's like no that's fine so i read it to him and then like looked up at him you know like ex- expectantly and he and he was it was funny cuz he there was this little table and he was sitting there and he was kind of sitting there like leaning over and with his legs rocking you know kind of swinging his legs back yeah. and forth and he was just like p- pondering and thinking and he said you could write that story badly and it would still sell <laughs> and and he said when that story's ready i want it and then he looked at me and then he looked at Michael Neff kind of suspiciously and he's and he's like how far along is this story <laughs> <laughs> you're like well considering it's I like, just finished the the pitch to it 10 seconds ago right. like, how far it's de- got a little work how far developed is this story and so I was about to be like what? you know I was I was gonna be honest you know um and uh and Michael Neff the head of the director you know of the of the conference interrupted me before I could say anything and he said he can have your first draft in six months oh boy <laughs> and and I and I looked up and I said I said yeah I can <laughs> you know just I'm like you bet oh yeah totally no problem and uh anyway when he gave me his contact information it was a Macmillan publishing by the time you know I was able to you know send out you know uh I think it was a year later where I was like, hey, like I'm still working on it. Are you still interested? And he's like, yes, I'm still interested. And so I kept going and, then, you know, I'd kind of reach out periodically, but then he changed his email, you know, because he no longer worked there. So then it was really difficult to try and get in touch with him. Oh, sure. And so I actually reached out to him on Twitter and uh, and he still remembered me. Okay. And was like, here, you bet. Here's my email. Cool. It's like, you know, and to, to keep in touch. And so, so that's... Um, uh, that's how I was able to keep in contact with him. But by the time I was able to really pin down the story, uh, I think that window had closed. It's an amazing story to 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 kind of understand the realities of an industry, you know, being a writer and your desire to be a writer. These are all things that have really become important to you. But that process of, you know, going from just raw talent and, and molding that into something that is essentially marketable while honoring what it is that you want to do. It's an important journey. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think that the, when I, when I wrote the, the first series is that it was purely intuition. Right. And then I realized that you have to be able to do it consciously. Mm -hmm. It's like, when creating a piece of art, for example, without a background in art principles, you feel like you're shooting at a target in the dark, yeah. hoping that you're going to hit something. Right. And maybe 50%, 50% of the time, you're going to create a composition that's, that's actually good. Mm-hmm. And, but you don't know why it's good. Yeah. And then you have to learn all the principles behind it to be, to be able to hit a home run every single time. Yeah. And then once it's conscious like that, then you can hit a home run every single time. And so that's part of becoming a student of the craft. I realized that with writing, I have to I have to learn all these storytelling elements so that they're conscious, so that I have 100% control of them for when I want to, you know, yeah. uh, convey a certain uh, feeling or, or use a certain technique. And so... You really, you really have to, I think, embrace the the long road, and that especially with writing, there there are no shortcuts. That's great. That's great advice, Saul. So the book is called My Friend Merlin. You can find it on Amazon. Um, how else can people connect with you, Saul? Yes, yeah, so you can connect uh, at my website. So 
my pen name is actually my first and middle name. So uh, my middle name is Rip, R-I-P. Mm -hmm. And so it's just SaulRip.com. Great. And there you can find my other titles as well. Great. And we'll, uh, and we'll link all that in the show notes so people can connect right to it. Pick up the book, um, you know, and, and, and experience, you know, this multi-year journey, this passion of yours that you have created. Well, I tell you what, with, with this one, this book was the one where I wanted to implement and prove that I had internalized all of the principles of good storytelling, not only for screenwriting, but for novel writing. And so there's a lot of different formulas and recipes almost for a good, a good story. Yeah. And with, when you almost like a litmus test, right? You run it through the litmus test and be like, Oh, is this, is this good or not? Is this true or is this not? Yeah. And running it through every single one of those filters, it checks every single box. Awesome. And it took me four years to be able to do it. Well, and I imagine that the next time you do this exercise, it won't take nearly as long. Not nearly as long. Because you've learned these lessons, you've figured this stuff out, and, and, and you just did it perfectly. You went to the writer's conference, you talked to the right people, you had the right contacts, and now, and now you've got this product, and now you're ready to see if, you know, how the market responds to it. Absolutely, yeah. Well, Saul, I really, I really appreciate you coming in and telling us your journey, your story. I'm excited to see what happens with your book and with your future writing career. Um, and it's, it's very awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Well, and I really admire the podcast. I've been listening to some of the other podcasts, and I'm loving them. Um, and I've been sharing them. And so keep Thank it up. You. Keep it up. And I can't wait to keep listening to others. Cool. Thanks, Saul. I appreciate it. And I, you know, and the whole purpose of this is to inspire people to, to do what you're doing, is mm -hmm. to follow things that are important to them and, you know, to find greater meaning in their lives and to believe that they can do things. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, to believe that there are great opportunities and, and we can go do them. Yeah. And, uh, and I love that you're doing that. I love that you're making that thing happen in your life and, you know, and, and learning, you know, in the process. I appreciate that. Well, yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time as well. I, I really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. You bet. Thanks all. Thanks everybody for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'd love to have you interact with us on Facebook at Socks and Soul Podcast. Look up Saul uh, on his website, check out his book, My Friend Merlin, and we'll talk to you next time. The Socks and Soul Podcast is a production of Ditto Film Media. If you enjoy this content, be sure to give it a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Join the conversation on Facebook at Socks and Soul Podcast.